When I was nine years old, growing up in Windsor, Ontario, Windsor, Ontario is right across from Detroit. I was going to Catholic school. As most of you know, when I grew up, I, I was Catholic. You know, if you're Italian and if you lived in Quebec, Canada, you were Catholic. I mean, there's no way around it. And in those days, boys and girls my age went through a Catholic ritual or ceremony called confirmation. Confirmation was what one of what Catholics call the seven sacraments. The word sacrament from the Latin word sacrare, which means to consecrate. The seven sacraments were, as I say, Catholic rituals through which it was believed God blessed man with grace. According to Catholic thinking, as I said, there were seven of these sacraments, baptism as a baby, penance, you know, going to confession, going to see the priest in that small little closet where it was dark and there was a, a wall between you and the priest and he'd sit on one side, you'd, you'd kneel on the other and he'd open a little lattice uh, door there, there, you could kind of see him and then you would you know, confess your sins and he would give you advice and so on and so forth. So that's penance, the sacrament of penance. There was also the sacrament of Holy Communion, which is the Lord's Supper, the sacrament of Confirmation, and according to Catholic theology, a person received the Holy Spirit at the sacrament of Confirmation. Then there was the sacrament of marriage, Catholic marriage, the sacrament of Holy Orders, and that was when an individual became a priest, and then the sacrament of extreme unction, unction to, you know, to, to put oil on someone, uh, to anoint someone, and usually that was given when someone was very ill or dying. I have to explain to you that in Catholic thinking, the idea of grace was like, like a spiritual vitamin pill. It made you stronger spiritually. So when you received any of the sacraments, you also received like a dose, if you wish, of grace. Now as a young Catholic boy, I had been baptized when I was a baby. I went to confession. Uh, I received communion. I began when I was six years old. I still have the picture. My mom kept that picture, eight by ten of me like this, you know, in my, in my first communion blue suit and armband and rosary beads. That was my first communion, if you wish. And then at nine years of age, I was ready to be confirmed. Now this ceremony, the confirmation ceremony, was performed usually by the local bishop in the Catholic Church. A bishop was in the hierarchy of um, organization. A bishop was an individual, a man who was in charge of several churches, if you wish, several parishes. So the priests were uh, you know, ministering in the local parish and a bishop was in charge of a whole uh, area, if you wish. And so the ceremony was performed by the local bishop and it was the time when young people confirmed, that's why they called it confirmation. It was a time when young people confirmed that they believed and accepted the faith given them by their parents and the church. So they were given the faith at a, at a time when they couldn't understand it, but by the time you got to be nine years old and you had taken all the catechism classes, you were ready to accept the faith on your own. If you're wondering where is he going, just stay with me, okay? I'm, I'll get there. Usually the bishop would, uh, we'd all line up, the rows like boys on one side, girls on the other, and the bishop would be here and they would say mass and then we'd all come forward and usually what the bishop would do is he would place his hand on the cheek or on top of the person's head and it was taught that at that very moment you received the Holy Spirit. What was interesting as I look back now on this, of course at that age I hadn't read the Bible, I didn't know anything about that, just catechism, but what was interesting about this is that when I was a baby I was baptized based on the faith of my parents. You know, we often say to people who are Catholic, well, how can you be baptized as a baby? You don't have faith. The answer is, well, my parents, I was baptized because of my parents' faith. And when I was baptized as a little baby, Catholic teaching says I was forgiven of original sin. And then when I was nine years old and I was confirmed, what I was doing was I was confirming that I believed everything that I had been taught by my parents 
And at that moment, through the laying on of hands, if you wish, of the bishop, I was receiving the Holy Spirit. Isn't it interesting how that is, it contains some of the elements that are contained in the Bible, but it kind of has them out of sequence, doesn't it? Well, that's not what my sermon is about. I'm just trying to explain to you what happened to me as a child. The point is this. One of the features of the ceremony of confirmation was the fact that the children, us, were going to make promises to God. It was a time when we made a promise to God. We were taking vows. And I remember still to this day the vows that I was taking. Number one, never to use alcohol. I promised never to use alcohol. I promised when I was nine years old never to use nicotine in any of its forms. I also promised when I was nine years old not to be involved in any sexual activity before marriage and not to have any impure sexual thoughts. I was making these vows when I was nine years old. Of course, by the time I was 19 years old, I had broken all of these promises. And by the time I was 29 years old, I had broken every promise I ever made to anybody about anything. You know, it would have been helpful for me when I was nine if I had been taught what the Bible says or what the New Testament says about promises. Instead of making promises, I should have been taught what the Bible teaches about promises. You know, in Matthew chapter five, verses 33 to 37, it says, and if you have your Bible, you can follow along. Matthew 5, 33 says, Jesus is speaking and He says, again, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of His feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black, but let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond these is of evil. That's what I should have been taught when I was nine years old. My life was proof that we shouldn't make promises to God foolishly because we do not have the power to guarantee that we can keep those promises. What I should have been taught were the promises that God makes to us. I shouldn't have been encouraged for me to make promises to God. I should have been taught the things that God has promised us. And the sureness of those promises because He has the power to keep the promises that He makes. You know, you can't turn back the hands of time, but you can make up for lost time. And so in our study this evening, we're going to look at some of the promises that God has made to you and to me. Promises that will never be broken because God has made them. Now in the Bible, there are many promises that God makes to different people at different times. But there are three particular vows or promises that God makes that affects everyone, no matter who they were or where they lived. Promise number one that God makes to us is this, a promise to sustain the earth. God makes a promise to all of us that He will sustain the earth. Look at Genesis chapter eight, verse 20 where the summary of that promise is made. After the great flood, Jesus, or, or the Lord says the following. Genesis 8.22, He says, While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. You know, the promise was spoken after the most cataclysmic natural catastrophe in the history of mankind, the great worldwide flood. An event that destroyed every living creature except eight people and those creatures that were on the ark. 
We know that uh, th these are alarming times that we live in. We know that there are a lot of alarming environmental trends happening today and we should be concerned so we can be better stewards of the creation. But nothing happening today can compare with what happened to the earth then. You know, we hear about the doomsday of what's happening to an, our environment. But if you look back to what happened back then, what they warn us about today is nothing compared to what happened back then. Every living creature killed. Never mind some obscure moth you know, <laughs> being destroyed or becoming extinct. Every living creature killed. The ecosystem completely shattered. Societies destroyed. Without Noah, it would have been the end of all life. And God brought this disaster onto sinful man, and yet afterwards He promised that as long as the earth remained, there would be a renewal of the seasons and enough to provide for man's existence here. Imagine God enabled His creation to come back from such a catastrophe. God promised that He would renew the earth even from this devastation. We find out, and I want you to go to 2 Peter, please, this time, 2 Peter. In 2 Peter chapter 3, we'll read from there in a minute. 2 Peter chapter 3. Uh, Paul, uh, Peter tells us that the earth will one day be destroyed, but it won't be destroyed by a flood, and it won't be destroyed by man either. It'll be by intense heat, and it'll be at the command of God. We read in 2 Peter chapter 3 this time, verse 7. It says, but by His word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. You notice, it's not about the environment. Peter's talking about the destruction of the, of, of the earth. And yet his comment within this passage is not about the environment. It's not about, boy, won't that be terrible? The earth will be gone. Won't that be terrible? The sky, you know? He doesn't talk about the, the creation itself. He makes one line that, the, that it'll be destroyed in the way that it'll be destroyed. But the only editorial comment that he makes is the reason why it hasn't happened yet. And that is because God is patient. Because God's priority is not the creation. God's priority is that man repent of his sin. That's God's priority. In the meantime, we are living here based on God's promise. And this should be a source of comfort and encouragement to us when every day we are bombarded with news reports and movies that are telling us, well, that the planet will be inhospitable or inho uh, inhabitable. Uh, yeah, that's right, I got it right. Marty, I've got what you got. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Must be this pulpit here. We will not be able to live on the earth in the next 50 years. That's what the news is about. That's what everybody is thinking about. That's what so much money is about, and yet, Peter makes just a passing comment on how the entire thing will be destroyed and focuses in on the reason why God is sustaining it. And I'm telling you, the reason why God is sustaining it then is the same reason God is sustaining it today. It's not about the environment, it's about repentance. God's promise indicates that our earth will continue despite environmental damage. You know, many countries continue to report record-breaking crops, greatest harvests in certain foods in all of history. If we're in such bad shape, why is that happening? 
We're continually finding new ways to recycle our waste into useful products and fuel. You know, a good example of this is the recent trend to create building blocks out of recycled garbage. In the past, we used to build cities on top of old garbage dumps. Engineers tell us that in the future, we will be building cities out of our garbage dumps, because our garbage dumps will, will produce the materials that we're going to use to build new buildings and new cities. Through advancing technology and discoveries guided by God's providential care, the earth will be a viable place to live until Jesus returns. We don't have to worry about that. I mean, there are a lot of things to worry about, but that certainly is not one of the things that I worry about. Good stewardship requires that we be concerned and involved in preserving our environment, but faith, faith prohibits us from being afraid. Yeah, I'm concerned about the environment. Yes, I want the, the rivers and I want the water to be clean and fresh. And yes, absolutely, I want to be able to breathe in clean air. But I don't lose sleep over that. I contribute to that as best I can. What I lose sleep over is that people still do not believe in Jesus Christ. That's what I lose sleep over. God promised an earth that could sustain life. He has and He will keep that promise until the very end. I don't doubt that. That's one of God's promises. Promise number two, a promise to supply our needs. In this passage, I want you this time to go to Matthew, familiar passage, Matthew chapter six, please. And I'm reading the familiar passage because it seems that even though it's a familiar passage, people continually forget what it says. Let's go down to verse 24. We won't read the whole thing, just verse 24. Jesus is saying, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will He not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. In this familiar passage, Jesus is explaining God's promise to individuals about meeting their personal needs. We all need things and God knows this. Did you ever think that God has created us in such a way that we are not self-sufficient? Have you ever thought that God could have created us as self-sufficient? He could have created us in such a way that we didn't need air to breathe, we didn't need food to eat, we didn't need water, we didn't need companionship, we didn't need love, we didn't need, you know, we didn't need anything. He could have made us in such a way that we, we were completely self-sufficient, but He didn't make it that way. He purposefully made us in such a way that we depend on things. Even sinless Adam had to eat. He needed a companion. He required meaningful work. Even Adam without sin was a dependent being. What Jesus is saying here is that God knows that we are dependent beings. 
He knows that we need things. He's saying that God even knows what our needs are, not just our wants, but our needs as well. And he's saying that God will provide everything that we need if we make the doing of His will our number one priority. Unfortunately, we don't always get that, do we? Such an easy concept. Make His will a priority and He adds everything that you will need. Such an easy concept, but so hard to do. What usually happens is that we make the fulfillment of our needs and our wants our number one priority, and then we try to do God's will as much as possible without interfering with those activities directly related to fulfilling our needs. So I'm going to invest my emotional and physical energy, my spiritual energy, into getting the things that I need, and if I've got some time left over, I'll give it to God. And God is saying the exact opposite. Invest yourself emotionally and spiritually into finding out what what I want you to do, and I guarantee that I will provide those things that you need for your life. In other words, what we do is we neglect our spiritual lives in order to invest more time and effort into getting our needs met. And when we do this, what we don't realize is that we may or may not succeed in getting what we want, but we risk losing out on the kingdom, the thing that we need most of all. On the other hand, when we don't compromise the kingdom, when we put the Lord's will first, despite the inconvenience to our careers and our agenda and our finances, our families, whatever, God will find a way to supply our needs somehow and we will continue to grow in the kingdom. Our problem is we really don't trust Him to take care of us we still think we're in a better position to take care of us than He is. God promises that the earth will continue until the end of time, and that if we make the doing of His will our number one priority, He will provide everything we need to live on this earth, and He'll find a way to do it for us. And He'll do this either by multiplying the results of our efforts, or supplying us from sources that we never considered. Because you see, all we see is what we see, but we don't see what he sees. I have a story about that. When Lisa and I and uh, three children, William wasn't born yet, we moved to Oklahoma so I could go to school and I only had one check from one church that was providing us support while I went to school. No check, no food, because I wasn't allowed to work. I was here on a student visa and Lisa was here on that type of visitor's visa. So I wasn't allowed to work to earn any money. That one check was all there was. We were five people living in a very small apartment and I was going to Oklahoma Christian. And so the check didn't show up when it was supposed to show up. And another day goes by and the check's not in the mail and another day goes by and the check's not in the mail and we're running out of food. We got three kids to feed here. And so now it's Friday. I still remember it. So now it's Friday and for supper on Friday it's peanut butter sandwiches and the the rest of the milk. Now you're saying, well, why didn't you ask for help? Too proud. I could have gone to the elders. In those days, we were members at Edmond, big old church. I could have gone to the elders and said, you know, the check hasn't arrived, you know, but I, I was embarrassed. And I thought, you know, the Lord is going to provide. I know He's going to provide. He's not going to let me down. He's not going to make me go beg the elders for food. Come on. So we said, you know what? I won't go to the office on Friday to ask for food. I'm going to trust in the Lord. The check will be there on Saturday. Because you know the, the church office closes Friday. There's nobody there if you want food. So what happens? Saturday. Thank goodness for Saturday mail, because we don't have that in Canada. So Saturday, I go to the mailbox. Oh yes, check. Be there. Open the thing. Go through the mail. No check. No check. No check, no food. And I was kind of disappointed, you know, saying, man, what, what's going on? You ever, you ever said that to God? <laughs> what are you doing, God? So I came back in the house and Lisa and I go through the stuff and you know what? You, you, maybe don't you remember, but remember Welcome Wagon? Uh, Welcome Wagon was a community thing uh, where 
uh, they would welcome new people into the community, and we were new into the community, and they would send you vouchers, coupons, and we happened to have an envelope with coupons. We looked inside, there was a coupon for a free pizza, there was a coupon for two burgers, there was a coupon for a, a gallon of milk, and Lise and I and the kids were in the car going from 7-Eleven to Pizza Place to McDonald's, you know, getting food for Saturday and for Sunday. And on Monday, the check arrived. Who says that God does not have a sense of humor? <laughs> he promised that He would take care of us. Promise number three. Promise number three really touches me, being an only child. Any only children there? You know what I'm talking about if you're an only child. Promise number three is the promise never to leave us alone. You know, growing up, my parents always worked. Today that's nothing new, but back in the early 50s that both parents worked all the time. You know, used to come home, have a key. I had my own key. I was seven years old, I had my own key to the house. Always alone, always alone. So it's a very nice promise here that Jesus makes, never to leave us alone. Matthew 28, 20, of course, I could go through other scriptures, but where Jesus is talking to the apostles and He tells them to go and preach the gospel to all nations. And in verse 20, He tells them to teach them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now Jesus originally made this statement to His apostles, but the promise is for all of His disciples for all time. The word here for age in this passage is eon, which means not just to the end of their lifetime, but to the end of time itself. God will not leave us alone. If you're a little kid growing up and you're always alone after school, and you're always alone in the morning to make your breakfast, and if you don't have any brothers or sisters, you're always alone every time your parents move. And when you grow up and your father dies when you're a kid, you're even more alone. And so the promise from God that says, I will never leave you alone is very important. In Psalm 139, and I use the Living Bible Translation, I want to read you a psalm from somebody that knew what it meant to be alone at times. It says the following, and if you want to read 139, O oh Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit or stand, when far away you know my every thought. You chart the path ahead of me and tell me where to stop and rest. Every moment you know where I am. You know what I am going to say before I even say it. You both precede and follow me and place your hand of blessing on my head. This is too glorious, too wonderful to believe. I can never be lost to your spirit. I can never get away from my God. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the place of the dead, you are there. If I ride the morning winds to the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me, your strength will support me. If I try to hide in the darkness, the night becomes light around me. For even darkness cannot hide from God. To you the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are both alike to you. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit them together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. It is amazing to think about. Your workmanship is marvelous and how well I know it. You were there while I was being formed in utter seclusion. You saw me before I was born and scheduled each day of my life before I began to breathe. Every day was recorded in your book. How precious it is, Lord, to realize that you are thinking about me constantly. I can't even count how many times a day your thoughts turn towards me. And when I awaken in the morning, you are still thinking of me. 
In this violent, temporary, transient world, it is a great comfort to know that someone will always be there for us to listen, to comfort, to strengthen, to guide. Of course, this was not a new idea. God's servants always knew the sweet experience of having fellowship with the Lord as I read in Psalm 139. Now this wonderful promise of His constant presence in our lives gives us three very important things. Very quickly, it gives us motivation. Motivation to pray and pray constantly because He's always there to listen. Have you never woken up in the middle of the night just because you can't sleep or you need to get up and use the restroom or whatever and you come back to bed and you're awake and you start to pray? Have you not done that? Imagine God is always waiting for you to pray. This knowledge gives us courage, courage to confess and abandon our sins no matter how bad they are because His sacrifice is always available to us to cleanse us, to heal us, to restore us, to fellowship again with God. Any day, day or night, I can be okay with Him. I don't have to wait for a festival day. I don't have to wait for a feast day. I don't have to wait for a high holiday. I don't have to wait for the priest to do anything for me. I don't have to wait as I did as a child for Friday at 9 a.m. to go into the priest's the little box and confess my sins. Any day, any moment is the right moment to go before God and say to Him, Lord, this thing here, this is wrong or this thing here I've missed. Have you never done it while even sitting in church and said to yourself before the bread and the fruit of the vine come around, Lord, I am not worthy. I'm looking back over just my morning and I'm not worthy to do this. Please forgive me. Everything I've said to you tonight points to the idea that you can have confidence that that forgiveness is there for you at that moment if you ask. Not only gives us motivation and courage, but also comfort. Comfort in the darkest moments because when there is no one else to turn to, when all hope seems gone, Jesus continues to be there ministering to our souls. Those who belong to Christ are never alone. Even in death, if everyone we know and love are gone, Jesus will be there to see us through. That's a promise, such a comforting promise. When somebody is about to pass, uh, like our sister Nancy uh, recently, uh, she was in hospice. Kay and the family were there to try to be with her. They played music and people sang songs and prayed. Why? We want to be there at the moment that they pass so that they're, quote, not alone. And how many times have I known this in my own experience? Someone will say, All I, we just went to the cafeteria to get coffee and we came back and the nurse said, oh, your dad has passed. And they're like, oh no, I wanted to be there for that moment. I didn't want him to be alone. And the promise is, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter where you are. The one who is in Christ is never alone, especially at the moment when they transfer from this place to the next place. You think, you think God doesn't understand how we feel about death? how much we want to comfort the one who's about to enter into it? You think he doesn't know about that? The one that sent his son to die on the cross? In this world of broken promises, isn't it comforting to know that someone can make and keep all of his promises? The earth is still here. We are witnesses for all of our lives that, uh, that the seasons have followed each other and the harvests have continued and the promise from God Himself is this will continue to happen until He is ready to make it stop. And have we not all eaten today? Are we not all clothed despite all the difficulty? Is anyone here destitute? Has God not provided for our needs? I know many of you who've gone through difficult times just in the last three years that I've been here and I've, I've been with you when you were going through the worst of it, when it seemed it would never end 
And yet six months, nine months, 14 months later, all of a sudden the sun has come out in your life and you're breathing the fresh air of renewal and somehow life is just getting better. Why is that? Because God said, I'll take care of you. He didn't say, it'll be easy. He just said, I will take care of you. And hasn't the Lord been there for you personally? Have you not found Him when you searched for Him in prayer? Which one of us can say, I called upon the Lord and He didn't answer? I needed forgiveness and He refused to give it to me. Is there anybody here who can stand and say such a thing? God has surely kept His promises and will continue to do so concerning the earth, concerning our needs, and the promise to never leave us alone. We have His word on these very things. So when we all head for home tonight, let's make sure we take the promises with us. If someone asks you this week, so you go to church? Yeah, so what'd you get out of the sermon, especially the one on Sunday night? I want you to answer them, I received the promises of God. I was reminded of the promises that God has made to me. And I say to you, lay them carefully in the safest places in your heart and review them constantly. Let them be your secret treasure that gives you confidence to start each new day with joy and thanksgiving and patience so that you can overcome every trial. And when you count your wealth and are ready to distribute it to your children and to your children's children, don't forget to pass on to them the marvelous promises that God has given to you today in this place. Of course, one promise continually offered every time the gospel is preached is the promise of a new life in Christ Jesus. If you suffer from the guilt of sin or the fear of death and condemnation, God promises to forgive all of your sins and give you peace of mind that nothing can destroy. And so I invite you to believe this promise. I invite you to come and claim for yourself the promise of salvation that God has made to everyone who comes to Him in faith and repentance, ready to express that faith and repentance in the waters of baptism. If you need to claim any of those promises tonight, we encourage you to come forward now as Johnny leads us in our song of encouragement. Shall we stand and sing, please? <laughs>